All right. Hey, Zach, how are you doing this fine, wonderful day slash evening slash morning, depending on when our listeners are listening? For sure. Yeah. Kind of, kind of a later evening, um, for us, but yeah, thank you so much for, for having me on the show. It's a, it's a privilege. Thanks. Awesome. Thank I'm glad to have you on. Uh, we were just chatting before we hit the record button and, uh, I mean, you could probably vouch for me. I was getting giddy. I'm like, this is going to be great. And then I'm thinking, wait, we probably should start recording the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited to share and and to add as much value and help as many people as I can. So I'm excited to be here. Should be awesome. good. Now you're in the Utah area, right? And I'm over here in Texas. Yep. Uh, what parts of Utah? So I'm uh, about 40 minutes north of Salt Lake City. My office is here in Layton, Utah. Okay. Okay. A good friend of yep. mine from college, uh, born and raised in Salt Lake City. Uh, she's a violinist. So on occasion, she's working for the. Uh, uh, is it the Utah symphony or the Salt Lake city symphony, whichever mm. symphony is in Salt Lake city. She's been probably the Utah symphony that, okay. that's, that rings a bell. Yeah. That sounds more like it. Um, anyway, she performs with them from time to time. Um, that's cool. she's, she's obviously very talented then. She's good. She is yeah. very, very good. Yeah. Um, it's all that practice in college paid off. So that's good to see. Yeah. <laughs> um, now you yourself, you're married, you've got two kids. Um, how did they come about? I mean, the kids, I think we know the science, behind it, but not that part. <laughs> right. Um, well, the first one was an accident. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny, you know, the, the podcast stuck in the rut, you know, that was actually my wake up moment. The first yeah. kid that was born. Oh. Um, I remember in the hospital and I was excited to be a dad. I wasn't, you know, there wasn't a planned pregnancy. You know, we were married, we we're madly in love and we still are. And it was the greatest thing that ever happened. He's six now, almost seven. Uh -huh. He's so funny. He's a mini me. He wants to go do door to door sales to get weed weeding jobs and stuff with me because I started teaching him that that kind of stuff last year. And you know, I just love him. He's so fun. But the day he was born, it was one of the most beautiful experiences um, watching my wife um, give life to this beautiful boy. But I remember throughout that whole day, I could not shake the stress and the fear. And how am I going to pay the bills? Oh, wow. Well. How am I going to pay these medical bills? How am I going to pay my deductible? How am I going to pay for diapers? You know, and we just bought a house because I didn't want to live in the duplex that we were living in, you know, just before then. Uh, you know, it was a duplex I owned, but the tenants were paying the entire mortgage. And, you know, I was house hacking. And so I was living for free, but now I moved into a single family home to give my family a better life than living in a, in a rental. And, Dude, it was terrifying. It was stressful. It was scary. It was so very scary. Um, but you know, sometimes those uncomfortable things actually push us to get out of our comfort zone even more and solve the problems. So yeah. then that that was Hudson, my little, little boy, and then I have a little girl who's three, uh, Catherine. She's a sweetie. Um, she's. It's funny how they're born with personalities, man. Yeah, very different personalities. She's sassy and. Um, Oh uh, man, they're cute though. Love my yeah. kids. I've got a boy and a girl also. My son, um, yeah, he's the older. Uh, my daughter is actually my mini me, which is odd. But uh, yeah, when you see us together, we're both the same hyperactive, quirky folks. And mm -hmm. and then my wife and my son are more like each other. Um, <laughs> but man, uh, so how old were you when your son was born, Hudson? So good question. I'm 32. <laughs> I have to do the math. So I was what, 25, 25 years old. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was about 20, 25, somewhere around 25, you know, and my wife was actually only 21. We got married. Um, you know, we'd been married for about a year and a half when, when he was born. Um, you know, so she was super young. We got married super young. She's from Brazil, actually. Okay. And so, you know, we were dating. I met her when I was serving a Christian mission down there. And uh, so I lived in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I speak Portuguese fluently and um, learned that just to serve the mission. And it was a great experience, but I met her down there and fell madly in love with her and her family and, and you know, getting here, the immigration process, everything. Uh, but we got married very young and I plan to build, build up financially and be a little bit more prepared to be responsible. You know, my wife, wife didn't have a driver's license. She didn't have a permit to work. She came on a tourist visa. We got married according to what our attorney advised us. So she didn't have a work permit. She didn't have a driver's license. Um, I was paying for everything, paying for school. 
um, it was, it was a struggle, man. It was a struggle to get to where we're at. And, um, but man, it's been an incredible, incredible experience to be a father and a husband. And yeah. they're definitely, they're definitely, um, a ton of my motivation. You know, I was, I was here working late tonight, um, calling students, actually supporting students and helping them. I'm going to get emotional. I'm kind of an emotional guy, but that's fine. So, um, fine. <laughs> so she texted me, she texted these pictures to me, um, of my kids. They're at the, uh, at the local theme park. We have a theme park called Lagoon. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I was, I was going to go, but I had so much to do and I had this podcast and stuff. So she sent me this, but this is, um, uh, I don't know if you all, y'all are in the YouTube or picture versions. We see my little family there and, um, look at the, uh, this one's my favorite. This is my little girl on the ride home. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's so cute. They just completely <laughs> passed out in her car seat, oh. head to the side, you know, just obviously they played so hard and, yeah. um, man. but yeah, man, it's, it allows my, you know, what I do for work is pretty awesome. I do get a lot of freedom. You know, I spent a month in Brazil with my family this year, um, and, uh, with her family and, uh, we do a lot of traveling. We get a lot of have, we have a lot of fun. Yeah, I do work. Um, but yeah, man, they're, they're awesome. I love my family. That's nice. I mean, I, I understand that you have a lot more freedom now than you did just six years ago. And, and you just mentioned that, you know, when Hudson was born, uh, I mean, you had all these concerns, like, how do I pay the bills? How do I pay, you know, these deductibles? How do I navigate this thing called our healthcare system? And yeah. then on top of that, you got a very, um, legitimate concern. Like, how do I keep my family together legally? Because, yeah. um, you know, we got, we got to get some citizenship going for, for, uh, you know, Mrs. Booth and, um, so what kind of work were you doing? Like, what was life like around that time? Like professionally, what was going on? Um, yeah. And I mean, you had the stress of the new house as well. Um, so, I mean, that was obviously, you know, brewing up some, some angst, some anxiety, maybe, you know, almost a uh, potential to get stuck financially. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> yeah, it was, it was tough. So I kind of give you a background on myself professionally. So when I, when I started um, working, I was 11 years old. So my, I was raised by a very stern father. So grateful for him. I think stern fathers are great because they kick you in the butt because life's going to kick you in the butt and they teach you how to work and they give you, um, they give you a lot of good things. You know, I love my father dearly and I'm grateful for that, but we had a lawn mowing business growing up. And I mean, I was doing door to door sales when I was 12, selling lawn aerations. Um, I was mowing lawns after school at 13. Um, when I was 11, you know, I was too small to push the lawn mowers. So I, I did all the blowing. I did all the weeding, the general maintenance weeding as they were going through and mowing. I, my dad would kick my butt if I wasn't weeding with both hands, you know, so I got, I got, taught, <laughs> I got taught to work at a young age. So by the time I was 17 years old, I had had probably 10 different jobs. Um, I had worked for the family business. I had gone to Nova Scotia, Canada and worked there for a summer doing yard uh, landscaping and taking care of a summer home, a family, family friend summer home. Um, I had made handcrafted cheese. I had worked in a wood mill. I had done taxidermy. I had uh, finished carpentry, framing houses. Um, I had done all these different jobs. And part of the reason I did all these different jobs is I had an uncle that always told me, earn and learn, young man, earn and learn. So when I felt like I figured out how to kind of do the basics, I would move on. Um, and when I went to Nova Scotia, Canada, my junior year of my summer and had all these different jobs, my last job was was going away. And I, had, I was working about 80 hours a week that summer. Mm. And um, I mean, I was putting in crazy hours. And it was hard, hard labor, building retaining walls, throwing sod, um, you know, cutting down trees. And uh, I remember at nights I'd wake up and I'd get, I'd get such bad cramps in my hands. I'd have to open up my hands with my forearms Oh, geez. because I was working so hard. And, um, you know, having that experience at a young age, I was so grateful for it because I realized I wanted something different for my life, right? I, I knew I needed something different. And I remember I was asking my dad about money. He didn't grow up with money. His dad was an alcoholic and a gambler. And he, you know, was borrowing money from his neighbors to feed his younger siblings. Like my dad had it rough. And so it's one of the reasons I have even more respect for him from what he came from to who he is today and who, who he encouraged me to become. And um, 
I remember when I came home from that experience, my boss in Canada was, was a nightmare. He ended up going to jail shortly after I got home. Actually, it was, it was, it was bad, but I had read a book called rich dad, poor dad when I was 14 years old. And I, I had a, uh, my dad's friend who has a bunch of real estate introduced this book to me. And at that stage, I knew that I, in life, I knew that I needed to get into real estate and I knew that I needed to be responsible for my own financial future. And so I knew that I wanted to start a business, but that experience in Nova Scotia, Canada allowed me to do it. Um, my dad wouldn't co-sign a loan for a truck. He said, if you wanted one bad enough, you'd find the cash. So at 17, I finally had enough cash. I bought my first truck. I bought my first cell phone. You know, the smartphones hadn't come out yet. They'd be coming out in another two years. But I bought a brick phone from, um, I got it from Cricket because Cricket was the only place that allowed you to get phones without credit. My dad wouldn't go sign for a phone, right? My dad really allowed me to learn and, and, and suffer. Um, but he had cut me off financially at 16 as well. So I had to come up with the money. I had to do it to play basketball in high school and whatever I needed to do, um, pay for insurance, dates, you know, I paid for everything except for housing and food. And um, they gave me a couple hundred bucks a year for clothing. And um, anyway, so I had this life experience, you know, growing up, working my butt off. So at 17, I wanted to start my business. I was ready. I had, had saved up the cash to buy my truck, buy my equipment, but I had barely enough. I remember I didn't even have money to put gas in my truck to go do door-to-door -door sales to get my first clients. I had to walk from my parents' house to get my first clients. And so I went door to door from my parents' house to get window cleaning clients. I went and bought some squeegees and I, I, there was some construction down the street. I stole an old paint bucket and cleaned it out from my bucket. Like, I mean, I was, I was broke, 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 broke. And I went to work. I, I remember the first sale I got was like 30 bucks to clean her windows. I was like, heck yeah, it took me an hour to do it. I walked back to the house, got my truck, drove to her house, got the 30 bucks. And I did it in a couple hours. Like, oh, that's like 15 bucks an hour. We're going to crush it, you know, and <laughs> went and put gas in my truck. <laughs> and, and I just started working, you know, and um, I, I started saving up some money. I started feeling like I was loaded. I had some money. And then I went and bought an old beat up truck and flipped the truck for a couple hundred bucks. So I'm flipping vehicles and I'm, and I'm washing windows and then I bring on my first few employees and then at 19, I went and served a Christian mission and I paid for a majority of that mission. And I had $10,000 saved up. I had bought two trucks. I had multiple employees. So, I mean, I was, I was working hard, you know, and then I came home for, I shut the business down. I came home from that, that experience. I was gone for two years, uh, serving and helping, which was another thing that changed my life. It was, it was a moment in my life that I stopped and gave back 100% gave to others for two years. I mean, a hundred percent of my time was to others and it allowed me to have a different perspective on life. And I was able to have a little bit better view and understanding and what I'm trying to accomplish and, and what really I want out of life and then take that work ethic and put those two things together. Um, and it's been pretty incredible. So I built that business up. Um, I ran it for a total of 10 years minus the two years on the mission. Um, by the time I sold that company, um, from the outside out looking in, I was really successful, Yeah. but I, but I wasn't right. That was, that was about the time my son was born when I got out of that business. Oh, like and got rid of the business and then your son was born. No, my son was born and I was still running that business. Okay. And about a year later, I got out of window cleaning, but you know, from the outside looking in, I was super successful. I had three trucks and 10 employees and I, or 13 employees at the most who fluctuated 10 to 13. And we had done just shy of a half a million dollars in sales and window cleaning for that year, but I was barely making anything because I had all these expenses and overhead and trucks breaking down and engine blowing, you know, blowing up on the truck. And I replaced the engine it blew up two weeks later, you know, like <laughs> It was just one problem after the other. And, um, you know, I had some, some successes elsewhere as well. I, you know, I had um, made some tutorial videos on cleaning windows to train my employees, put them on YouTube and they blew up. You know, I ended up on the history channel because of it. And like, I, I had a lot of success from the outside looking in, but I was stuck. I mean, I felt like I was stuck. I hated the industry. I hated what I was doing. My rotator cuff was going out because I was constantly on the jobs because all my employees were calling in sick all the time just not dependable people. And I was not making enough money to give the life to my family that I wanted to. And then with all the other things that I was dealing with in my life, 
You know, I had to drop out of college to be able to pay the bills and pay for immigration fees. And I was doing trade work for my attorney at nights, doing, um, uh, doing, uh, I did some sheetrock in his vaulted kitchen and I put in naughty elder doors and basin case and put in a slate entrance and did a whole bunch of work for him to pay for immigration because I couldn't afford it all. And, um, you know, I was, I felt like all I was doing was working, but I wasn't spending time with family and I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't yeah. getting ahead. And I had an experience where I had bought that duplex. You know, I had mentioned it earlier in the show where I was living in one side and renting the other. And I bought it back in 2012. And, you know, I could rent the one side for 850 bucks and my monthly payment was like 500 bucks. Oh, nice. So even so I was making, yeah, I was making a lot. I was, I was making profit just off of one tenant. Yeah. So when I bought that single family home, putting that other tenant in place was covering the mortgage of both properties, right? Between those two tenants, which was fantastic. And I thought I need to do more of this, but the problem was I couldn't do more the way I was wanting to, because the banks now required debt to income right? Because I was trying to buy commercial. I was trying to buy investment opportunities, not properties I was going to live in. Yeah. They wanted more down payment as well that I didn't have. So I started hitting all these obstacles and I wanted to get into real estate investing, but I didn't know how I felt stuck. I wanted to want to create financial freedom and rich dad, poor dad. And everyone's talking about like, you got to invest, you got to be an investor. And it's like, well, what do you do if you're freaking broke? Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, how do you make your money work for you when there is no money? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So that's, that's kind of how I got into window cleaning and how like it, I started down that path of real yeah. estate. There's a lot of powerful stuff you just shared in that. So your work ethic, the product of your dad, just not handing stuff to you. And I'm just thinking about, you know, the power that a father has, you know, yep. uh, and I'm, you know, going to make sure my son listens to this episode because he wanted me to co-sign for a car for him a few months back. And I said, no. And he was mad. <laughs> I was good. <laughs> it's like, I love it, bro. He, he bought the car himself anyway, without me co-signing and he got a better deal on a different car. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, just for those who are worried, like I can't give my child everything in the world. It's like, well, you don't have to, you know, just no. give your child the freedom to go earn it him or herself. And you, you build that work ethic within them. And then, um, you know, just listening to everything you'd gone through, you know, in the early part of your life and, you know, way back at the beginning of our conversation, when you were showing me photos of your family and, and getting choked up, like you see that it's like, this is the struggle and the work that you put in as a father and a husband to keep mm -hmm. this family together, to create this family. And, um, you know, that's why I get choked up too. When I think about my family, it's, uh, cause I was in the army at the time when I started my family and, you know, survived operation Iraqi freedom. And, um, wow. you know, so it's like when I look at my family, like where we are now, and I think about those early years, you know, I, I lose my stuff. Um, so it's, I, I just wanted to take a quick moment to kind of reflect on that and, you know, let the audience have that sink in that, you know, this is good stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, strug struggling's good. It yeah. sucks in the moment. And, and I remember being so mad at my dad. My dad would say things like, I don't want excuses. I want results. I wanted to yeah. punch him in the face, but I am so freaking grateful for him now. You know, I remember when I was 16, he sat me down and said, okay, you're a man now. You can drive, you can take care of your own crap. And he's like, when I was your age, I was feeding my, my, my parents and my siblings, you know, like it's time for you to grow up. Mm -hmm. And I remember he, he said, he said this. And then the next weekend we went camping as a family. We still spent time and had fun. Like my, my dad wasn't like, you know, a horrible dictator. He still was very loving and we still spent lots of fun time together in the mountains and gave me a love of the mountains, but he allowed me to struggle. And I'm sure that was harder than just giving right Hard, harder than just giving into my whining and to my, my begging. Yeah. Um, but I remember we went into the gas station and he offered, you know, he got treats for my younger brother and for my mom and for him. And I was like, Hey, could you buy me a big gulp? But back then I remember they were exactly a dollar. And uh, he said, no, if you want it, you can buy it. And I remember being so upset that it was only a dollar, but I thought about it and I wanted that dollar more than I wanted that big gulp. And I walked out of that store without the big gulp, very mad at my dad, but it taught me to be frugal and go, what do I want to use my money for? If I save up my money, I can flip vehicles. Yeah. Right. And, and it made me think. Yeah. Oh, he, big time. That was the, probably the best gift your dad could have given you was, yeah. you know, that tough love. And, you know, people are like, oh, how could he do that? It's like, no, he did good, guys. He, that, that was like, 
and it was probably hard for him. He probably wanted to, you know, just yeah. lavish you with all kinds of gifts. But I think by doing that, it it did create that character within you and that sense of frugality and business sense. Um, and so that leads us into like what you wound up doing, getting into real estate. Um, cause we now kind of established your why, you know, what created you, your origin story in a sense with your dad, you yeah. know, instilling that work ethic. And then that why your, your family, you got this beautiful wife, you've got this beautiful baby boy, and now you want the world to be a better place for them. And so a year after his birth, you, you got this aha moment that says, all right, this window washing business has provided, it's served its purpose. It's time to let that go. Um, and then you had a, a dabbling with the duplex. How did you grow your real estate earnings from there? Like, you know, yeah. you went from a duplex to way more than that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, I don't want to bore the audience um, more than I already have, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a struggle, right? And I had a lot of hiccups and ups and downs and I had a few wins. I did end up getting a couple properties from a client that I washed windows for. He gave me an awesome discount and, you know, so I had, I had some belief that it was possible, but I had all these struggles, you know, he gave them to me seller finance because I couldn't qualify and I ended up making a ton of money on those properties, but it's like, I kept having all these obstacles. And while I was out washing windows, I'm reading books, listening to podcasts, trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it. But I found out about something called real estate wholesaling. Okay. Basically what that is, is where you go out and do the marketing, right? You go out and find the sellers that basically want a pawn shop for their house. They're done with it. They're going through uh, an inheritance situation where they just inherited the property. They're done with it. They got crappy siblings they don't want to deal with, right? They, they're they tired landlords. They don't want to deal with tenants anymore. It's kind of run down. They've made their money. They don't care about the money. They want the convenience over the money, right? So there's certain situations where you can find super good discounted properties, even in really hot markets like this. So I learned this. I'm like, okay, well, great. I've seen it happen. I did it with a tired landlord window cleaning client, right? And I got those two awesome properties. How do I do it consistently? How do I do that? Because once you find that disc, deep discounted deal, you don't even have to get debt or buy these properties. You can do um, an assignment contract. Basically what that means is you put it under contract to buy, <clears throat> excuse me, and you sell that purchase contract to a different investor. They close on the deal. So you basically get paid for finding the deal. Mm -hmm. You know, my biggest wholesale fee is about $85,000 which is crazy. And I'm, you know, my average wholesale fee, my average fee for assigning a deal is, is over, is around $30,000 here in Utah. I'm doing it in Florida now, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that, but I'm making about $18,000 a deal in Florida. Um, but what's cool about this is now I'm getting lump sums of cash by doing real estate wholesaling. And I'm also getting to go, okay, um, I'm going to, keep the best and sell the rest is like how I like to say it, right? It's like this one makes a ton of sense for, for a buy and hold to build my net worth, to build cash flow, and I'm going to wholesale the other ones and get my cash. And so it's allowed me to go from barely making anything to making over a million dollars a year, right? To making a million per year. It's absolutely crazy. And the way I got into this is I'm listening to these podcasts and that kind of stuff. And I found a mentor. I found a guy named Tom Kroll. He's actually no longer coaching, but he taught me how to do real estate wholesaling. Gave me the steps A through Z. So in 2017, um, you know, I had dabbled and struggled part time, and I heard about wholesaling. He gave me access to his course um, the very beginning of, of February, and I sat my business partner down that I had eventually brought into my window cleaning business on my birthday, March 2nd, 2017. Said I quit. I'm <laughs> out. I am giving up on real on window cleaning and I'm going to be a real estate wholesaler. And he says, but you haven't even done a deal. And I'm like, I know it's because I'm doing a window cleaning business. He's like, you are crazy. And, and I only, and I was crazy. I only had a couple months before I went belly up and couldn't even buy my, buy food for my kids. But I knew that I had, I could do it. You know, when I was getting my window cleaning business up and going in winter times, when it was hard before I had all my commercial contracts and stuff, you know, I was cleaning toilets at night. I was building farmhouse tables uh, with, you know, just pine two by sixes, right? Like I could find ways I could flip vehicles. I could do whatever I needed to, to feed my family, but I was going to go be a wholesaler. And so yeah. by the, by the time I had, um, 
let's see, by April of 2017, like a month after I walked away from window cleaning, I did my first wholesale deal where I sold the purchase agreement. I made $10,000, no risk, no debt. I made 10 grand on a property. By the end of that first fiscal year, from April to the end of the year, we did 115,000. The next year I did just shy of a half a million. The year after that, I did 1.2 million. Um, and then this year we're on track to do um, anywhere between 1.5 and $2 million um, in assignment fees. Yeah. Gosh, unpacking what you just shared there too. I mean, um, I think the first thing was you pruned something out of your life, out of your income stream that was taking up a lot of effort and not paying off a lot to go for something that had a much higher promise for a payoff. Yeah. And, you know, so that very smart because I mean, pruning for plants, if you want to plant to thrive. It was, it was terrifying. It wasn't yeah. smart. It was terrifying. <laughs> oh yeah. I didn't say it was not going to be terrifying, uh, but there is that because a lot of people, you, you know, they don't take that leap because the fear says, oh no, 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 no. I need the income I can count on. And even though that income amount is lower than where they could be, they don't, they don't go for the potential. They they hold on to what they think is safe and what they think is guaranteed. Um, not realizing that if they, if they do it smartly, cause I mean, you also found confidence too. You, you knew you were just a few months away from, okay, now I can't feed this family. And the whole point was to be able to feed this family and more. Um, so you knew that risk was there and then you found confidence. So you're like, but I've endured this and I've endured this. I know I, if it comes down to it, I will clean toilets again. I will, you know, and I, that creates this formula, this combination of ingredients uh, that um, I think sets you up for that success in combination with the other stuff we've been talking about, the work ethic from your dad, the why of your family. Um, it, and I'm, I'm saying this because there's somebody listening right now saying, yeah, but it's like, no, I, I also, I also want to give credit where credit's due, right? You know, I don't, I don't think that I'm the smartest guy in the room. I don't think I work the hardest, you know, there's guys to work much harder than me. Yeah. Right. One thing that I had to my advantage was a mentor that had consistently helped other people accomplish what I was trying to accomplish. Not only was he doing himself, but he helped other people as yeah. well. I knew that if I followed his steps that he gave me, I could, I could, get the same type of results, right? I was committed. I was going to do the action steps. And so, you know, I'm grateful for my mentor. I still have mentors. I, I've had so much success over the last five years of my life, more so than I've ever had in, in all of my other business experience. But it was the first time I started hiring mentors. I've dumped so much money into masterminds, into coaches, into one-on-one -on -one coaches and advisors and coaching products. And, and every time I have like this new goal or something that I'm trying to accomplish or something I'm working towards, I find someone that has done it and is currently doing it and currently helping other people accomplish exactly what I'm trying to accomplish. And I pay them whatever the heck they want, what they want, because I want what they have to offer me. Right. So I, I believe so much of my success has come from, yes, my father, him giving me um, the life that I have and my mom, she's a hard worker. She's crazy. She shot her first deer with a bow and arrow when she was pregnant with me. She taught me how to fish. She, she climbed up in a tree last year and shot a bear with a bow and arrow. And I had to go help my 60 year old parents pack out this ginormous bear and all the meat and stuff. Right? I have wild parents and they're hardworking and they're wonderful people. So I have so much to, to say about them um, to my creator. Um, sorry, um, who, who he has been for me and uh, kind of have a personal relationship there. I don't like to talk about religion. I don't like religion, but I believe there's a big man up there and he cares about me and cares about all of us. And I've had amazing mentors. And so I've had a ton of success, but um, more than anything, I'm grateful. That's why I'm emotional right now because I'm just full, full of gratitude for what's happened to me. But I don't believe that that I'm a unicorn. I don't believe that... I'm the only one that deserves this kind of success or the only one that's capable of having this kind of success. That's why I'm on this podcast, not to brag, not to be a, wow, look at me, but to encourage other people that if you have desires to be successful, you can and should be. Yeah. And you're in turn helping other people do the same thing. So you've found what works, you've taken the lessons you've learned, and now you're helping other people achieve the same thing. Um, I know one of the things we were chatting about before we hit the record button was a project you worked on, uh, I believe around January, 2021, 
And um, I, I want to hear more about, I mean, I heard about it, but I want to hear more about it. And then um, I'm going to go check it <laughs> the out. The gritty details. Like, yes. Right on. Yeah. So like I said, I believe other people can be successful. And um, yes, I do coach and I have a coaching program and and, and all of that, but you know, that's not why I'm here today. Um, you know, it's not what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to get people to sign up. Um, if you do want to coach, yeah, sure. I'd love to talk to you about that. But you know, I was up super late one night because I was trying, I was thinking like, how do I inspire people like to take action and go for this business? You know, not just like sign up for my program, but actually like take action and make money in this business. And I thought about my experience, like what took me from being a doubter and not believing that you could get houses at 50 cents on the dollar to like actually believing it and doing it. Right. And I thought back to my experiences and I was like, well, I met that client that I wash windows for, right? He was a tired um, landlord. He had had a couple multi-million dollar development projects going and he had these two rentals he didn't want to deal with. He hadn't collected rents in like four months. He didn't care. What? Yeah. yeah They're like <laughs> half a million dollars. What he sold them to me for both those properties, they're worth like 800 grand, 750 grand. Right. Wow. And um, anyways, he just didn't want to deal with them. He's like, ah, I could list them, but the, the, the real estate agent's driving me crazy. She wants me to go you know, have a few things fixed so they can qualify for FHA financing and, you know, all these things. And he's like, I just don't want to deal with it. If you'll buy them, I'll give them to you seller finance at a great deal. I'm like, done, let's do this. <laughs> and, and so I had that experience and I was like, wow, this guy way more experience, way more wealthy. And, you know, he just gave me equity. He just said, sure, take them. I don't want to deal with it. And it was like a huge win for me. It was a win for him. He didn't have to deal with them. Yeah. Right. And so I was like, okay, how do I find more of those people? And, um, and that, that led me down the journey to believe in, in getting a coach, like being willing to invest that hard earned money and to go through that fear of like getting a coach and following action steps. I, I knew that it could be possible because I'd seen it done in my own life. Yeah. I just needed more of it. And so I was like, how do I give people that same blessing, that same gift of confidence, that same gift that it can be done. And so I was brainstorming wait, late one night. I mean, it was like three, four in the morning. I couldn't sleep because I was like, I got to solve this problem. I can't go to sleep till I know how to change people's lives. And um, I had this idea. I had watched recently a show called Undercover Billionaire. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you guys haven't seen Undercover Billionaire, much better than the YouTube content I'm going to share with you guys that I did. But the Undercover <laughs> Billionaire freaking awesome. It's my favorite show on the planet. So his name's uh, Stern's Frank Stearns, I think he's a billionaire and uh, he had kind of the same mission that I had. He wanted to show people the American dream is still alive and well, right? And so he took a hundred dollars. He did way cooler than I did, right? But he took a hundred dollars and he flew to a, a new place that he never been, doesn't have any friends, changed his identity, right? So he couldn't use his billionaire name as how to get things done because mm -hmm. um, there is definitely, you know, success brings okay. more success, right? So changes his name, gets a hundred bucks, a beat up truck and a smartphone. He is freaking cleaning toilets and living in his car. And his goal is to turn that hundred dollars into a million dollar company in 90 freaking days. Oh, man. It is the coolest show on the planet. And I'm like, I got to do that, but I got to do it around real estate investing and real estate wholesaling, right? Like I got to show people what it takes and so they can believe it and go for it themselves, um, you know, help the action takers. And so I took a thousand bucks. I gave myself 10 times more. <laughs> <laughs> I gave myself a uh, thousand bucks. I uh, bought a plane ticket to Tampa, Florida. I never been to Tampa, Florida. I rented an Airbnb. I rented a car and then COVID hit. And I didn't know what the health oh, complications geez. were. Yeah. So that was a year ago. COVID hit. I didn't know what the health complications. I had to put it on hold, but I went and did it this January. So 12 months later, jumped on a plane. I flew my family down to Brazil and I was going to be without my family for 30 total days. I was going to make a huge sacrifice to not be with them. So they're going to go spend time with my fam, you know, my extended family in Brazil. I land in Tampa, I have a film crew following me. And the goal is to take that thousand dollars and turn it into 40 grand or more in just 40 days. And um, in the last 10 days, I'd get my family back. Crazy things happened. We had massive amounts of success. And I see, keep saying we, me and the camera guy, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> It was so hard not to have my regular team, right? Because now I have a full-blown business and a team and I just like left them and I let them run the business and I went and started from scratch. And, um, you know, within that time frame, I got seven total contracts. Two of them fell apart. Two, I kept as rentals. Three of them, I wholesaled. I made 
$93,000 assigning those 30 days into, you know, with the 30 days, my wife's supposed to come home. She tests positive for COVID. So she couldn't come home. I couldn't do it anymore. So I flew to Brazil for the last 10 days of the challenge, got COVID, got two contracts while I was down there. One of those was a $53,000 deal that I got over the phone. Um, but yeah, man, it was an adventure. It was an experience and all that content was filmed and put on the YouTube, on my YouTube channel for free. So if you guys have any interest in getting into real estate investing, more specifically real estate wholesaling, like I don't believe there's better content to show you how freaking hard this business is, but how rewarding it is, right? It, uh, it was an incredible experience. I mean, one of the sellers that I met, I met him on day four, Jerry, he's actually going to, he's, um, we're soon, I'm sure by the time this is uploaded, um, my, my episode on my podcast will be uploaded of Jerry, that seller that I met. And man, I just had some, some amazing people I met and had a, a great experience. So I'm, I'm excited for people to check that out and learn more and, and grow from, from the experience. Nice. I know definitely after we stop this recording and we hang up and you get to go back to your family real quick. Um, I'm definitely going to look this up on YouTube. This this is awesome. Yeah. Cause I, I think I shared with you, um, I'm getting ready to sell my house in Corpus Christi as my wife moves up here to Dallas and we get to be back together. Yes. Um, and my intent and we've talked it over is that the, the equity we get out of the sale is going to, um, go towards investments. And, uh, and that's because, uh, original plan was the house that we've been living in since 2004 is going to be our first rental property. Well, it's like a seller's market right now. So I started doing the math and I'm like, wait a sec. Okay. I know I can rent for this much. I got to pour in this much anyway. Cause I really hadn't updated the house since 2004. And a cousin of ours is a realtor. And I just asked her for some comps like, Hey, if I rent it, what am I realistic and thinking what I'm thinking? Uh, I see the numbers on Zillow, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm just curious. I know it's a seller's market. What are the comps for my little old house? Assuming I put this much work into it. And she showed me, I was like, Hey, Liv, no, my wife, I'm like, we're gonna have to sell the house. And she's like, <laughs> Good. Cause I didn't want us to hold on to this thing. There are too many memories in it. So for her sentimental wise, it was going to kill her to have our original home that we raised our kids in as the rental property. And, and like, how could you just sell it out like that? And like let strangers live in there. And, you know, and so us just selling it outright is that closure she needs. And then we've already agreed the, the equity is going to be for investment property. And I'm like, great, we got, we got like X number of months to figure this out. So Love all it. that to say, I'm watching that video as soon as we're done talking tonight. So <laughs> definitely, definitely should. And you should definitely learn about real estate wholesaling because in this market where everything's so hot and overly priced, um, it's even more important to find a good deal. Yeah. Now, I'm a big believer that there is no bad time to invest in real estate. There's only bad deals. Yes. And it's a lot, it's a lot easier to get into a bad deal in a hot market, right? Because everything's overpriced. Yeah. But if you're sourcing your own deals and doing your own marketing, you can find houses 50, 40, 60 cents on the dollar. Seriously, you can. Okay. I do it all the time. All the time. I've bought in five rentals this year. You know, I, I've I've built up my equity in those five properties by almost seven hundred thousand dollars. That's how much equity I've gotten out of five deals. It's crazy right? So it can be done. So I just cherry picked some of my favorites. We've got one flip right now we're working. Um, you know, we're doing the remodel and it's worth 1.4 to 1.6 million fixed up. And we got it under contract for $750,000. Needs a hundred thousand dollars in remodel. So our profits are going to be anywhere between four and $600,000 on one project, right? That is only possible because we're sourcing our own deals. If you're trying to go to the MLS to buy rentals and to buy flips and stuff, you're going to really struggle in this market, but right? you can dollar. still be. Yeah. yeah. But, it, but think about it. If the market does crash and everyone's like, well, what happens if it crashes? What do you do? It's like, well, you just make even more money because now there's even better deals, Everything especially if sale. you're sourcing yes. them. Yeah, everything's on sale, right? So when you get stuff off market, it's really, really on sale. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I love this business, dude. Definitely check it out. Learn about real estate wholesaling. Check out my podcast as well. And it's awesome stuff. Nice. Now, speaking of that, um, as we're wrapping up, where can people find that podcast and, and your website? And let's say even after they watch the YouTube video, they just absolutely have to have you walk them through the process of the first you know, deal. Uh, where can they find you? Where, where are you 
in the interwebs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely don't want you guys like to apply for the coaching program until you know, like this is what you want to do. Cause it's a, it's a big commitment. So please check out the free content first and like, know that this is what you want to do. Because if I coach you, like your picture goes on my office wall um, to remind me who you are and what market you live in. And like, I'm calling your butt if you're not doing the work and giving me updates on accountability Mondays, because my goal is to get you out of my office and off my back, literally onto my success wall um, and have you on my podcast and stuff. So, so be, you know, before you, before you go book a call, make sure you're serious about this, but um, you can go to my website. It's dfdmastery.com. Uh, stands for driving for dollars, right? DFD, driving for dollars, dfdmastery.com. Um, in that website, you can book a call to talk to us about the coaching program when you're ready to do that. Um, but remember to check out the free content. There's a link to my podcast on that web episode or on that uh, website. Um, and the podcast is great. I love the podcast. Um, somewhat new in comparison to some of my other content. Um, but then you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, everything I have is branded DFD Mastery or Driving for Dollars Mastery. So my my um, Facebook, uh, you can follow just me, Zach Booth. My Instagram is Zach Booth, and then my um, my YouTube channel is DFD Mastery. So if you search DFD Mastery, you'll find my YouTube channel. Nice. And uh, before we sign off, one final piece of wisdom, uh, one final message for the audience. <sighs> wasn't prepared for this one. Sorry. <laughs> um, you're good, man. No, this is, this is good. Um, I, I'm going to give the piece of advice that, that I give most people. Um, there's a ton of opportunities in this world, right? There, you, there's success everywhere. You can make money in a lot of different spaces. Um, what you first need to identify is what you exactly you're trying to accomplish. You need to find someone that's consistently, um, consistently doing that in their own lives and consistently helping others get those same results because doing it and teaching it are two different things, but you want to find someone that's doing it and teaching it, um, consistently and then follow their action steps and you'll have the life that you're trying to build, right? I, I would not be successful without my mentors. I would not be, I know for a fact I wouldn't, um, so that would, that would probably be the piece of advice I'd give. And I think that's all parts of life. That's business. That's your marriage. Um, I had some awesome counsel for my own marriage. Um, that's for parenting. That's for, uh, for everything, right? Because if you want to have success, there is a blueprint. There's a reason that certain people consistently get results that you're trying to get. It's because they're doing things differently than you are. It's not that they're unicorns or they're better or prettier or more intelligent. It has nothing to do with that. They're doing action steps that you're not. Exactly. Man, Zach, it's been great to have you on the show. Um, you're genuine, authentic, humble, uh, servant heart. And, uh, I mean, the, the abundance mindset is clear. I mean, you're, you're willing to give more than you're asking. And, and so that's just, uh, great to have you on the show and, and, uh, thank you. That's, I'm just like speechless and like, thank you. <laughs> no worries. Well, thank you for the kind words. And, um, I'm glad that you, you feel that there's been value in, in what I've shared and I hope the audience does as well. You know, um, definitely if you like the podcast, I'm sure they you want them to rate and review your podcast. It'll add a ton of value to what you're doing and get this podcast out there to others. So definitely do that audience, right? Help out this gentleman here for putting out all this free, awesome content for you guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I feel so blessed. I feel compelled to, to try and help others as well.